Welcome to Hope at Night. Featuring Wayne Lemon. Ivan Omana. Q&A with our live audience. And host, Anil Kanda. Today's episode, Can Death Wake You Up? And here's your host, Anil Kanda. Welcome to Hope at Night. I'm glad you're all here because tonight we're going to be talking about the issues of life and death. A funeral is generally not something anyone looks forward to going to, but the first funeral I attended was my own father's at the age of 20. I grew up in the Indian faith traditions, and there is so much that happens at Hindu and Sikh funerals. Death does something to life. It recalibrates things and shifts our priorities. In today's show, we will discuss the topic of death with Pastor Dwayne Lemon. Our first interview is with someone who many thought was a born dancer. As a young man, he was a dancer for Queen Latifah, Heavy D, and other major hip hop groups like Wu-Tang Clan. He went on to choreograph for Brandy and other stars. He was rolling in the dough and felt he had arrived, but then something happened that led him to leave it all behind. We're going to be finding out what changed the trajectory of his life and if it was all worth it. Let's welcome to Hope at Night, Dwayne Lemon. Glad you're here, Dwayne. No, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, is it true that you actually used to perform for Queen Latifah? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Okay. So tell well, me a little bit about your background. Yeah, I mean, you know, I grew up in New York, Queens, New York. And, um, you know, hip hop was something that I, I, you know, hip hop was not just music for me. It was something about lifestyle. It was a way that you walk, the way you talk, the way you dress, the way you act. And so I used to say, I am hip hop. You know, it wasn't like I like hip hop. I am hip hop. That was what the culture taught us. So growing up, I really loved dancing. And uh, evidently, I was kind of good at it when I would go to clubs and different things. And there was some drama that happened in high school where I ended up kind of like dropping out and I just wanted to get to a point where I said okay well what am I going to do with my life from this point forward and then from there I told my mom and dad I said listen I want to dance I want to see if I can you know dance with the stars and they were like go for it now and let me ask you a question first yeah. how did your family recognize that you actually have dancing talent oh man it was in the backyard when we would have our barbecues and my dad was a very very busy hard-working man but at the same time dad would always you know love to do a barbecue in the backyard and we would play music and when we would play music it's like my feet just started moving I mean <laughs> involuntarily and next thing you know it was like oh my father would notice and he would say man Dwayne can dance and being a young boy wanting the you know the the adoration of his dad, when I saw how much my father loved seeing me dance, it made me just want to keep doing it even more. So it became a passion at a young age, and I just kept doing it and doing it and doing it. Well, we actually have some video of you dancing. We're going to play that right now so our audience can see this. So. Ah, okay. Yeah, this was a fashion show where I uh, was performing, and this is, this, is, this is what we just call freestyling. You just move to the music, or really let the music move you. Dwayne, I, am, I have known you before, but I'm even more impressed with you right now than ever before. <laughs> wow. This was the move I did in front of Latifah that got me the job. Okay. How yeah. old were you at this age? Uh, I probably was about, like, uh, I would say maybe 18, 19. Okay. Yeah. So you continue this, this um, with this dancing talent, mm -hmm. you've met more people, you got more connected with celebrities. Yep. Um, what life altering event happened to you at that time? Well, um, you know, while I was at the height of my career, I mean, I, I was doing really well, started to work with a lot of artists, and it was getting to the point where, you know, I wanted to work with Michael and Janet Jackson. Those were the two that I was going for next. But the next thing you know, my nephew Charlie, he saw how I was making a lot of money, traveling and doing a lot. And then Charlie was like, Uncle Dwayne, I want to make money like you. So I tried to get him in the industry, but they just didn't give him any attention. So living in Brownsville, Brooklyn, um, they used to have a nickname for Brownsville. It was called Murderville because, you know, you had a lot of body counts. People would get killed a lot. Wow. And it was a lot through drug dealing. And my nephew Charlie decided, well, if I can't make money in entertainment, I'm going to try it through drugs. And so the night he decided to sell drugs was the night that he was gunned down and killed by his friends. The very first night. The very first night. Wow. Yep. 
He wow. caught two slugs in his forehead and three in his stomach from a nine millimeter Glock pistol. And it was from his friends just kind of setting him up to ultimately take a lot of money and a lot of merchandise. So before you know it, I'm getting a call. Charlie has been shot and then four days in the hospital and then he died. What happened to you during this experience? I mean, it blew my mind because it was kind of like I already had you know, some questions going on in my head about life, like I think a lot of us do. But, you know, when I heard that Charlie was dead and now I have to go to a funeral, you know, Charlie was 19. I mean, so, you know, he wow. was very close to my age. And so when, you know, I went to the funeral, it's like I remember just watching. They couldn't even have an open casket because of the deformation that took place from the wounds. So when the casket started to go into the ground, that was like the first time. I felt him being pulled out of my life. And it was at that time that when I went inside the limousine, though I've heard this many times before, but for some reason when I was in that limousine, it's like everything got quiet. And all of a sudden I would hear this voice that just kept saying, will you accept me now? Will you accept me now? So you didn't grow up going to church consistently. You not wouldn't, at all. You wouldn't classify yourself as a born again believer. Absolutely or anything like that. not. You know, no. My mother was the daughter of a Methodist preacher. My dad was a former gangster. Um, you know, don't ask me how preachers daughters and gangsters. <laughs> That's probably another subject. But you know, we weren't religious. We did go to church like once a year on Easter, but that was it. So I did not grow up a Christian. We were not a Christian home at all. We just did what we wanted to. And, you know, we, we live by basic rules. Don't kill anybody, don't steal. You know, you'll be all right. right. So this, all my life, I would hear people say, you got to give your heart to God. And for me, I was kind of like, I'm busy. I always felt like giving your life to God means you got to give up what you love. So I kept rejecting, rejecting. But at this time when my nephew died, it made me start thinking about life. Like, wow, I'm gonna have an appointment one day with a coffin and you know, where do I stand? And it was at that time, I would imagine God must have seen, you know, this is the time to speak to Dwayne. And so when I heard that voice, will you accept me now? Will you accept me now? I said, this has to be God. And so that was the first time that I kind of responded positively to wow. this appeal. You know, there's something about death that tends to um, awaken things. Yep. It, it, it helps us to recognize what reality is all about. That's right. Right? I mean, yeah. sometimes we go through a period of our life or a season where we're not thinking about anyone close to us dying or mm -hmm. even ourselves dying, and then all of a sudden, boom, it yeah. hits us and we're shocked, we're surprised. Life is turned upside down. That's right. And we begin to recalibrate life itself. Mm -hmm. I right? mean, really, it's like, you don't think about death. Like most people don't walk around thinking about death. You think about life, you think about pursuit, you think about happiness, you think about goals and objectives. And so when you come face to face with death, especially if it's somebody you love, you know, you're really thinking to yourself like, man, I, this is the first time I'm really thinking about it now. Right. And from that, it starts to make you, you know, sometimes fear comes up you know, anxiety can right. kick in. You know, a lot of stuff happens because again, the average person doesn't walk around thinking about death no. until one day they come face to face with it. And I've been face to face with death in different ways. I had a shotgun shot at me, I had, you know, pistols. I've had different situations where you came close to death, but we, f we just felt like, yeah, I'm lucky. I, I made it, you know, sorry for the survived, other guys. Yeah. Yeah, I survived, I'm good. But it's like now looking at something where you have to deal with it, like, I'm not gonna be able to talk to my nephew again, you right. know, or whatever. It gets the wheels turning. Right. And, and you really start thinking about it. Dwayne, explain to us how in the world you ended up uh, going from this, this past lifestyle mm -hmm. of dancing, being connected to celebrities, being successful, rolling in the dough, yeah. to all of a sudden switching gears and then ending up as a, as a minister, <laughs> as a preacher, as someone who travels the world. Yeah. Uh, you run an online YouTube ministry. Yeah. Uh, how in the world did that happen? My mother, when, when I was at the height of just absolute rebellion, I mean, I, I was a bad kid. My wife one time asked my mother, tell me about Dwayne when he was a youth. I was like, man, I wish you didn't ask that. But you know, she did. And my mother said he was a demon. <laughs> and you know, that was, I was like, ma, you're gonna not only mess, mess up my game with this lady here, but, you know, I mean, so that was just a horrible thing. But she fixed it. She said, but now he's my angel. So I was like, all right, good job, mom. Good recovery, mom. But, you know, she was right. I was a bad kid. So at the height of my rebellion, my mother said, don't you know one day you're gonna be a preacher? Hmm. And I remember thinking to myself, mom, I'll die before I become one of those hypocrites, because that's how I looked at preachers back in those, back in those days. So, you know, from my mother planting that seed, 
you know, I tried to be a good kid as far as I knew, but after, you know, hearing God's voice in that limousine, I really started to genuinely pursue God. And that's the one thing is whatever I do, I genuinely pursue it and I pour myself into it. With dancing, I poured myself into it. With martial arts, I poured myself into it. With business, I poured myself into it. So with Christianity, I was like, I'm not gonna be a fake, I'm gonna pour myself into it. So I really started to study, I started to learn more, and it was like God became like real to me, where before he was like the big fictitious guy up there, but now he was becoming real. And through, you know, I'll call it experiment, you know, it's like trying things out that I read in the word. I was like, I think I like this right. and I like the impact it's having on me. And so the more that I kept taking it seriously, it was like the deeper I kept going. And before you know it, I'm discovering this ideology of having a relationship with God. And from that, man, it just, it became so real that it was kind of like, well, God is now like my friend. You right. know what I'm saying? So from that point, I immediately started sharing with all of my boys. I was like, hey, y'all got to hear this. I shared it with some of my art, some of the artists that I used to dance with, um, including Brandy. Brandy was a wonderful Christian young lady. And it, it was like, you know, we talked a lot, but the point is, is that it got serious. And from that, before you know it, it's evident that God was making a calling on my life because the more that I shared is the more people would follow and it became kind of evident, hey, God has endowed some gifts to you. You need to acknowledge those gifts. You need to cultivate it and start doing a new way of touching people's lives. And so that's kind of like what launched me into it. Uh, Dwayne, here, here's, here's my question though. You were confronted by tragedy. Oh yeah. You were confronted by the death of your nephew. You you, you confronted death itself. It came into your life. It changed your world. You yeah. lost somebody you loved. Absolutely. How would that lead you to love God? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, before, if somebody told me go to the book of Genesis, I wouldn't even know where that was. You know, I mean, I was thoroughly ignorant of the Bible, but Later on, I did discover a verse that did resonate with what I was experiencing at the death of my nephew. It was found in Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 2, and it says, it's better to go to the house of mourning, which is like funerals, than to the house of feasting, which was like parties. And I was like, why is it better? And it says, because that is the end of all men and the living will lay it to their heart. And so that's what started happening is mm. through thinking about life and this fear of death, I didn't want to live in fear. And so it was through that, that I was like, what do I do with this fear? Right. And then I began to read how perfect love casts out fear. And I was like, okay. So like I said, I wanted to experiment that. So I wanted to learn more about the love of God. I wanted to learn more about hope. I was excited to know, man, there's life beyond, you know? So these things began to make me pursue God, get to know him better, and want to share him even more with people. And there's a weird thing that happens, man. It's like the more you keep studying God and learning about him, almost supernaturally, there is a love that is birthed. Having been married now for 26 years, I get it. You know what I'm saying? It's like hanging out with my wife when she was just my girlfriend. You know, before you know it, I'm like, man, I'm starting to feel things towards her that is stuff I never really felt before, i.e. love. And it's the same thing with God. The more you spend time with him, it's like the more you pursue him and learn about him, you start to develop a love for him. Right. To and know him is love, to love him, right? Yeah, yeah, to know him is to love him. And so that's really how it started happening. So I came to him just to try to get over this fear of death, but he had a bonus package in mind. He was like, now I'm gonna give you more than just victory over your fears. I'm gonna show you how to love. Wow. And so it just turned into that and, and it's sweet. Uh, Dwayne, let me switch gears here for just a little bit. Yeah. And that is this. Somebody is hearing you, someone is listening to you, someone is, is watching this show right now, and, and they're wondering, wait a minute, I get this idea, you fall in love with this good God, but why in the world, uh, when we read something like the Bible, right, mm -hmm. we read about this uh, good God who created this, this beautiful world, why in the world is there so much death? Yeah. I mean, death is taught to be the most natural thing in our universe. It's the thing that impacts us and, and hurts us and changes us, reshapes life for us. Absolutely. Why is there so much death in a world that a good God created? Yeah, and I mean, you know, I, of course I dealt with that question myself. You know, it's like, you do wonder, well, Lord, if you're so good and so wonderful, why is all this bad stuff happening? And it's kind of multi-layered as far as uh, the answers that comes up in my mind. One of the first things is, is that 
One of the greatest things that God has given to creation, at least human, humanity, is the free will, this, this ability to make our own choices, whether good or bad. That's actually an expression of love, you know, is to not make robots that do everything you want them to do, regardless of how they feel, but to allow them the exercise of free will. And so while God is not the author of death, you know, he, he did, that wasn't his plan, but nevertheless, he had a plan of redemption in place to address it. But the reality is, is that God gave us free will. And the truth of the matter is, is according to the story of scripture, that exercise of free will, even though they were warned and told, hey, don't, don't go here, because if you go here, bad things can happen. That exercise of free will is what ultimately brought in this thing called sin, which brought in this thing called death, unfortunately. It wasn't God's plan. So God is still good. And I always started to think about it why is it that we have no problem talking about God, but we have such a problem talking about the devil? It's like, if there is God, then there's also what the Bible calls an enemy of God and his name is Satan. Mm. And the reality is, is that he's the author of death. He's the guy that instigated all this stuff. He's the one that messed up the plan and brought in this ideology of the cancellation of life. God is all about life eternal. Satan is the one that comes in and wants to take things away. So what you're telling me is death isn't part of God's plan. It wasn't part of God's original plan. It Absolutely wasn't supposed not. to be. Absolutely not. That was not his plan. He just simply gave people freedom. And in that freedom, we can choose life or choose death. But his plan was choose life. His plan was always go for life. But the reality is, is that through that exercise of free will, man, that you can even turn down God if you want. And that's the story of how this whole thing went down. Let me ask you one more question before we go to our break. And that is, why is freedom so important to God? Well, when it, when it could cause so much damage, there's so much risk with freedom. Yeah. Why is that so important to God? I love the fact that God has no problem taking that risk. I, I love the fact that he's like, yeah, there is a risk, but God is so confident of the power of his love that he is, he's convinced that if you can really behold me for who I am, I think one of the biggest challenges we have in this world today is a right understanding of God. And unfortunately, we paint our pictures of God through people. So if people do stuff that's crazy, we say, well, then God's crazy. You know, if people do some stuff that's dumb, we say, well, then God's dumb. So we often judge God through people. God is trying to cut the cord with that and say, why don't you get to know me for who I am and not necessarily just through people because people are frail. We make mistakes. So God is not afraid to take the risk of freedom because he knows that through the exercise of free will, that's how things last long. If you just simply do stuff because you're programmed to do it, even if it's against your will, sooner or later that breaks. That's the reason why we have marriages even after 50 years that end up divorced. That's why we have people who after a period of time are like, I'm done. Because everybody gets tired of doing stuff just because they're supposed to. You want to get to a place in life that you do what you do because you want to. Right. And God knows, well, the only way to get there is I got to give you the gift called freedom and then give you the wisdom to know how to guide yourself step by step on how to handle this precious gift called freedom. Wow. So I'm glad that God gives it to us. And I know that there's a risk, but I'm grateful he doesn't mind taking that risk. Yeah, and the rewards outweigh those risks, right? Guaranteed. Wonderful, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, those yeah. are powerful answers. It's time to go to a break, but coming up next, we'll meet someone who, had, who has confronted death both professionally and personally and is living to tell the tale. We'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back to Hope at Night. In our earlier segment, we met Dwayne Lemon, a professional dancer and choreographer for some of the biggest music stars in the industry. However, all that changed when the sudden death of his beloved nephew made him question what he was doing with his life. Now we will meet someone who has met death head on in his ears as a hospital chaplain and also in his life. Let's see what he has to say on this topic. Please welcome to Hope, Ivan Omana. Dr. Omana, what in the world is a chaplain? Well, a chaplain is a professional pastor who has taken uh, some extra training so that he could be a hospital chaplain or a healthcare chaplain or a military chaplain, whatever, whatever the case is. So what does a chaplain do? Well, 
let me talk about mm, what I did as a hospital chaplain. We did, um, we did visitation in the hospital. We, we covered emergencies. We did spiritual assessments. We did um, the same way a doctor asks you how you feel and then as a chaplain you do ask how you feel and then you devise a care plan that is spiritual in nature. Okay, so you're meeting people in the hospital who are diseased or hurt or they're dying and you're spending time with them by the bedside. You're ministering to them, mm -hmm. uh, you're counseling them. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you a question. With doing that for many years, does that affect you emotionally, internally? Oh yeah, it does, it does. In which ways? Oh uh, man, it, 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 sometimes it makes you callous. Right. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it makes you use um, a little bit of um, dark sense of humor. You know, you would laugh at things that people no, would normally laugh. Um, it serves as a bit of a coping mechanism, doesn't it? It, it is a coping mechanism. And uh, um, I remember, uh, I still hold the, the, the record of the highest number of deaths in one 24-hour shift. Um, How many is that, if you don't mind me asking? <laughs> 17. Whoa, 17 people died in on your ship. 24 hours. In 24 hours, wow. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the highest number of deaths. But I also had the highest number of baby drownings in one shift. I, I was working in Florida and I hated summers because summers meant that people were careless with their pools. So there was a Sunday that was a, on shift for 24 hours and I, we had five baby drownings. Wow. One after the other. I remember by the, by the third one, I called, I called my supervisor and I said, listen, you need to send somebody else because I'm starting to blame the parents and I'm becoming useless for these people. Wow. You, you would never think that the chaplain or the pastor would, would, would hit a limit but I can imagine as someone who's been in the hospital, I mean, I, I visited people in the hospital, but I thought to myself, I could not do this full time. Well, I did that full time for 16 years. Wow. What would you say was the hardest moment of you being a chaplain? Would you say it was that or was it something else? Oh, the hardest, um, I, I have a story for the hardest moment for me. Sure. Um, that day when we had five baby drownings, um, there, there was this, this man, he fell asleep and his daughter fell into the pool and she died. You see, by law, as a chaplain, I cannot tell the family that their loved one has died, but I have to be with them. So the doctor was inside taking care of another baby that came while they were taking care of the first one who had died. Are you with me? Yeah. Well, I knew that the baby had died, but when I went outside to be with the father of that baby, he kept pulling me, chaplain, please pray with me, pray with me so that God would save my daughter. And so I had to pray for a daughter who I knew was dead. It's already dead, wow. But I couldn't tell him that she was dead. Uh, how does your family deal with this? Do you, do, you, do you take these stories home? Do you unload on them or do you keep work at work? Well, you got to keep work at work. Okay. You know, there's there's such a thing as HIPAA right. law, and so you have to keep it back at home, back at work. But what I did, <laughs> my daughter kept saying every time, every time I had a difficult day, I would come home, sit in my in in my couch, and ask my wife to sit on my left and my daughter on my right, and hug them and cry and say no, don't. I wouldn't say a word, just cry with them. And so Yvonne, my daughter, would say, Daddy had a difficult day today. Wow, wow, that's tremendous. Uh -huh. Now, you recently lost somebody. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Um, um, just three days after my appointment as the Director of Chaplaincy Ministries for the church, my wife died of mm -hmm. cancer, just three days after. i um, hear that. It was difficult. It, was a, it wasn't a long battle, it was about eight months. It was a very tough, very aggressive cancer. Right. Um, and I tell you, it's, a, it's way easier when you're on the other side. Right, right. Because you can, you can take it when, uh, when you're part of the other side, but when you are 
with the ones who are going through it. It's just. Wow. That's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It is. Let me ask you a question. How do you find hope when things like that happen to you? when tragedy strikes you in the way that it did? How, how do you find hope? You're used to giving so much counseling and care and ministry mm -hmm. to people who are dying or, or, or hurting or whatever, but how do you yourself find hope when this happens? When you were talking with Duane, you were talking about death and you were talking about the, the reality that, I mean, this may sound a little bit morbid, but it is a proven fact that one out of every one will die. Right. right. It is a proven fact that you will have to face death no matter what, as long as you're on this side of eternity. Right. So um, how did I do it? It began one morning. You see, I, 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 I run when I'm stressed. I run. I, I, I try to do something so that I could I could kill the stress, if you will. And I was running in, I was, I, I was in Cote d'Ivoire and they took me to the beach and I love running in the beach. And when I'm stressed, my runs get longer. Mm. So I ran about, about 10 miles. Wow. And when I was in the farthest, to the farthest place, I fell on my knees facing the beach. And I said, God, I'm gonna love you if you save her and I'm gonna love you if you don't. I'm gonna put her in your hands. Whatever happens, I know she's in your hands. Oh. And when I did that, it's as if this heavy thing came off my chest. Wow, wow. You're, you're putting this person in their life and their future, whatever it is, uh -huh. into the hands of a merciful God and you're, you're leaving him. You're leaving that person with God. I realized that in, a, that, that in as much as I loved my wife, God loved her more. Right. right. So I had to trust God. Right. Right. It was painful. Of course it was painful. But um, I had to live what I preached. Right. So you're, you're a believer in the Bible. Uh-huh. Right? You're yeah, a believer in the Bible. I do. And then you go to a hospital and you meet Hindu people who mm -hmm. are dying. You meet uh, Catholic people who are dying. You meet uh, Buddhist people who are dying. And, and that's probably obviously not the time to give a sermon. Uh -huh. But what hope and comfort would you give to them? Well, in chaplains, we have this thing we call the ministry of presence. Um, words will not make a difference. As a matter of fact, if you talk to someone who has lost a loved one, you know, talk to them a few years later and ask them, you know, you know, what do you remember about what you were told? What do you remember about that pastor who came and preached for you at the funeral? Most of them will not even remember the slightest thing, right. but they will remember someone who stayed with them. Right someone who cried with them, hmm. someone who held them, mm -hmm. who held their pain as if it was something precious. Hmm. Wow. wow. That's tremendous. I, I, I actually, I remember when I was in my training as a chaplain, when I was in my training as a chaplain, I was called once in the hospital in Orlando to the 10th tower. That was the cancer floor. And it was a 34 year old woman who was dying. And her husband was, remember I got to that, to that room and the, the bed is right there and he's on the left side of the patient and I'm on the right side. She is struggling to breathe, 34 years old. And I, 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 you know, I extend my hand and I go, my name is Ivan, I'm the hospital chaplain. And the guy grabs, grabs my hand and he said to me, chaplain, do you think Jesus can perform miracles today the way he did when he was walking on earth? Hmm. And I was trying to let go, that, I was trying to lose the hand and he wouldn't let go. <laughs> I said, I think he can. 
I think he could. He said to me, well, I need it now. And uh, I couldn't say anything else, but he kept holding onto my hand. And he asked me that question three times. At the third time, I felt like the most useless person walking the face of the earth. And uh, I just cried with him. Mm -hmm. oh. I didn't say anything else, I just cried with him. Um, but an hour later, she died. And I became, I went into chaplain mode. I called chaplain mode, you know, this is what you need to do. I answered questions. Uh, you need to call these people. You need to do this. You need to do that. And I went into, yeah. By, by the time it was about five o'clock, he's ready to go home. The morgue people have come to pick her up. And he asked me if I could accompany him to the car. This is a towering, I'm, I, I know I'm vertically challenged but he was a tiring man and he, and I walked with him to his car. He opened the door, turned around and I said, and he said to me, chaplain, do you remember that I asked you about that miracle? I said, yes. He said, well, I think God did it. Hmm. And I'm like, what do I, do I need to get you checked to the ER here? <laughs> Cause she died. He said, it wasn't about she not dying. It was about me accepting that she was dying. Mm. Mm. So I stayed with him. He hugged me and left. Wow. Now, this is the interesting thing. About seven years later, I'm in my office. I'm in a different hospital by then. I've done all my training and all that. And I get a phone call from the secretary of the hospital where I used to be, where I met him. Ivan, there's a, there's a couple here who want to meet you, want to meet with you. And I said, well, I can't go over there. Can you send them over here? I was in, the, in a hospital south of Orlando in Kissimmee. Um, they sent him over. And when, I, when they got to my office, he looked at me. He looked familiar, but I, I didn't recognize who it was. He said, you don't remember me? I said, no, I really don't. Then the lady that was with him spoke, she said, you know, you were his chaplain when his wife died. And he's been speaking so much about the way you brought him hope that now that we're going to get married, we're coming from Indiana so that you will do our wedding. Wow. Mm. Wow. Wonderful. Yeah. The ministry of presence. The ministry of presence. You can't solve anything. You right. just hold it. Right, right. You know, it's so interesting. There's a book in the Bible. It's called the book of Job. Uh -huh. And Job, everyone knows, went through tragedy. Uh -huh. At the very end, he's asking a bunch of questions. Uh -huh. And God shows up, mm -hmm. right? And, and literally, that's how the book of Job ends. God shows up and starts asking, talking to Job. And, and you get this idea what Job needed more than just answers mm -hmm. was an audience mm -hmm. with God. Mm -hmm. He needed just the presence of mm -hmm. God to be there, right? The answers will come in the future, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I have a question for both of you guys, and feel free to answer it however you guys want. With your study of Scripture, your perspective of the Bible, and, and uh, meeting people of different faiths, what does the Bible teach about the subject of death? There are so many views out there regarding that. I grew up in an Indian faith tradition where we had so many views about death. But people ask that question, what really happens when a person dies? Are they whisked off into some heaven? Are they in some purgatory? Are they sleeping? Do they become angels? What in the world happens <laughs> when they die? So, Dwayne, you want to start? Sure. Um, you know, I'm reminded of the story of uh, Lazarus. You know, this was obviously someone near and dear to Jesus' heart. And the Bible says that one day Jesus says to the disciples that Lazarus is sleeping, but he's like, but I must go that I might wake him up. And the disciples were like, you know, our work is pretty important. Um, if he's sleeping, he'll be fine. You know, just let him sleep. And then Jesus said, well, let me sp speak more plainly. Lazarus is dead. So one of the first things that blew my mind was that God looks at death like a sleep. Hmm. And one of the things I love about that is everybody who sleeps eventually wakes up. Right. So, you know, one of the first things that hit my mind is like, okay, so death is kind of like a pause, but not a stop. 
you know, normally when I, you know, coming from the days of the boom box, you know, you had play, you had stop, you had pause, three buttons that you would do to play your music. And when we're living life, we call that play. But when a person would die, we would say, okay, that's stop. But in God's mind, it's like, no, it's not stop, it's pause. And the whole purpose of pressing the pause button is that one day you're going to press play again. And so this is how it kind of blew my mind that God looks at death like a sleep. And the Bible says that when a person sleeps, a time will come that they will wake up. Dwayne, let me follow up by asking that. So when they're sleep, uh, uh, sleeping, are they thinking thoughts? Are they dreaming? Is there consciousness? Like what's going on during that time that they're sleeping? That's an excellent question because that's what, that was my question too. Like I know what I'm doing when I'm sleeping. Sometimes I'm moving around. Sometimes I'm doing different things. So is that the same situation? The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, um, verses 5 and 6, it talks about the state of someone in this sleep. And it says that they don't have feelings, they don't have emotions, there's not an expression, there's no thought or any type of activity mentally or otherwise going. They are in an unconscious state. In the same way that I know at night I look at my clock and I see that it's nine o'clock, I go to sleep. Next thing you know, the next time my eyes open, it's 6 a.m. And it's like all these hours went by, but for me, it was like the blinking of an eye. So it is with someone in the state of the dead. When they die, they are in a sleep state. They don't have any brain activity. They're not aware of what's going on. They're not participating in things that's happening in the world. They're not doing any of that. They're in an unconscious state. And when Christ comes, which the Bible teaches, is that Jesus says, I'm coming again. And when he comes, there's gonna be a trumpet sound. And that trumpet's going to blow and it says the dead in Christ will wake up. They're going to rise. And so for those who are dead right now, like my mom, you know, like my dad, I lost my mom to cancer. Mm -hmm. So you know, any cancer story always hits me hard. But it's like, you know, I can't wait to see her again. It gives me hope. But knowing that right now she's asleep, you know, she's in an unconscious state. She doesn't know what's going on right now. And I'm kind of glad because when my dad, when my mom died, my father tanked. I mean, he went into massive depression, didn't take care of himself or anything. And the reality is, is that if my mom was in heaven immediately and just kind of celebrating, I don't know how much heaven would have been heaven to her being able to look down at her beloved husband going through all of this sorrow and pain and suffering. Dad, uh, dad suffered a lot. So I actually saw the wisdom of God in allowing when a person dies to be in an unconscious state. They don't know what's going on and they don't have a participation of what's going on. So that was my understanding when I began to search the scriptures on it and it brought a lot of comfort to my heart. Wow, wow, yeah. I, can, I can see that. That's Oh yeah. yeah. Let me throw a, a question out to you guys, okay? This is a bit of a challenging question, okay? Mm -hmm. I love what you just said there, okay? Yeah. This is hope for the believer. Oh yeah. But what if, what if you have someone you love and you care for and they want nothing to do with Jesus, they want nothing to do with the church, they want nothing to do with the Bible, they're not a Christian, they're not a believer, they go down a dark path and they die. What hope, what would you tell someone like that who says, wait a minute, what about my uncle, what about my brother, what about my sister, what about my mom or dad who, who didn't love Jesus, who didn't go to the church, who didn't read his Bible, wasn't interested in any of that stuff, what would you tell someone like that? Mm. Well, in my case, um, had a conversation with my daughter when my niece died that way. She didn't believe in anything. She, she actually had a very horrible death. Mm. Um, we had a closed casket because what we got was pieces of her. Uh -huh. wow. um, and my daughter, who was 16 at the time, I was talking with her, we were walking around the neighborhood. She said, Dad, I believe God is still in the business of saving people. So I believe God touched the heart of Mariana. That was her name. And I choose to believe that God did something for her. So I'm going to have hope. Mm. Yeah. So um, that's God's job. I mean, the Bible says God is love. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it doesn't say God has love or, you know, 
God is love. That's his identity. That's who he is. That's what he gives. That perfect love that yeah. casts out fear. So what I'm hearing from you is essentially leave judgment up to God. Leave it to God. Leave that. That's his business. That's mm -hmm. his work, uh -huh. right? And we put hope in mm -hmm. who God is, right? Uh -huh. That God is merciful, right? Yes. I have a thought on that too that I would like to share. Um, you got this very interesting story in the Bible. I always like to tell people God loves having closing conversations. Mm. And the reason I say that is because you got two guys on the side of Jesus, right? This is a crucifixion. Christ is there. You got one guy over here, another guy over there. And there's a conversation that Jesus has with, these, with one of them. Now you have to understand, these brothers were already crucified. So the death process has already begun. All we're waiting for now is for them to just eventually breathe their last breath. But the death process has already begun because they're already crucified. Jesus has this conversation with this man. Now, what we don't know on is- On the cross. On the cross. Okay. And what we don't know is if everybody else could hear that conversation. But we know that the person who needed to hear it heard it, which was that man. And in that closing conversation, and I love this story because for a lot of people, they're looking at the thief on the cross saying, okay, he's dying in his sins. That's the way it looks because he was a thief, he's being punished, and now he's gonna die. So he's dying in his sin. But what they did not know was that he, he and Christ had a conversation. And the Bible says that in that short little conversation, the man said, Lord, remember me. Mm. And Jesus assured him, I'm telling you today that you will be with me in paradise. And so what I love to give people in assurance is, listen, God is the master of having closing conversations. Mm. That closing even though, conversation. Closing conversation. So even though we don't know what's going on right now, God, if he can reach his or her heart, I guarantee you he's going to reach him. Right. because God loves having closing conversations. And so I try to give that as hope to say, I assure you, if your brother, husband, wife, whoever it is, if they could be saved as a result of God meeting with them, though they can't talk anymore, they are still able to have a conversation with God. When my nephew Charlie died, again, he got two slugs in his head. He was in a coma. He was gone as far as they were concerned in the hospital. But I remember my mother went up to him and my mother said, Charlie, I love you. And she said all these things to him. And then next thing you know, Charlie's face was dry, but all of a sudden you started seeing a tear pour down his mm. face. And it was, and, and the doctors began to tell us how one of the last things to go with a person is their hearing. Mm -hmm. So even though Charlie can't say, I love you too, or anything like that, he was able to hear. Now this is humanity. Mm -hmm. How much the more with divinity. Right. So right. if God wants to have a closing conversation, God's going to have that closing conversation. So I, I, like you, I leave them with that hope that God is the master of having closing conversations. And if he can save your whoever, brother, cousin, whomever, I assure you, he will be saved. That's beautiful. Yeah. And that's hopeful. That's hopeful. That's hopeful. That's, hopeful. that's the only answer to death, hope. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Hopelessness does not come from God because God is a God of hope. That's uh -huh. right. We are saved by hope. Yes. Right. <laughs> beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate the conversation here. Yeah. We're going to have a break, but when we come back, we get to hear some questions from our live audience for our guests tonight. Don't go away. Welcome back to Hope at Night. Tonight we've been talking about the issues of life and death through the eyes of a former professional dancer and choreographer and a hospital chaplain whose own wife passed away recently. I'd like to turn now to our live in-studio audience to see what questions they have for us regarding this all-important topic. So why don't we go to our first question right there? Yes, I have, uh, I'm approaching my older age and I want to know what is the best way to prepare for death is probably the best for the chaplain to answer this question. <laughs> In, <laughs> that is well, a tough question, by the way, if you haven't experienced it yourself, by the way. <laughs> you know <laughs> so, what? Let me just say first, have the conversation with your family. Mm. Talk to them about what you want to happen. Wow. You want to have that conversation before 
you're in the hospital and people are pushing you all over the place to make decisions. You want to tell them what measures you want to have done. You want to tell them if you want to be resuscitated. You want to tell them what is it that you want. You see, a lot of people, a lot of us avoid the topic because we somehow feel like when we talk about death, we're kind of invoking death. Mm -hmm. But remember, remember, statistically speaking, one out of every one will die. <laughs> So it's, it's a natural thing. We need to talk about it. So just talk about it. Tell them what you want. One of the best things that could have ever happened was for me to sit with my wife and she talked to me about what she wanted to have happen at her funeral. She wanted, she gave me permission to go find somebody else. And so um, it helped me to cope when we had the conversation. When you have that conversation, you're actually helping your family members. Wow, wow. Thank you, appreciate awesome. that. Good question. Let's go to our second question. Yes, uh, some people claim to have died, gone to heaven, and come back. I was just wondering if there's something from a biblical perspective that addresses this occurring. Do you know, um, I think we would all agree that if somebody had that kind of experience, we'd call it miraculous, you know, because it's definitely out of the norm. It's not natural. That would be supernatural. Miracles should never be ignored, but they are to be tested. And a lot of times people just automatically say, because it was a miracle, it must have been of God. But the reality is, is that even though they may have had a genuine experience, we have to test it according to scripture. As you said, you know, what is, what's the biblical perspective on that? Again, the Bible teaches that when a person dies, they remain in the grave. They don't immediately go to heaven. They will go to heaven, but they don't immediately. You know, if there's one person that I'm sure every, you know, Bible believing child of God would uh, agree with is that King David died a very righteous man. Um, he died really, really a wonderful person. Um, you can read about it in the book of first Kings chapter 14, verses seven and eight. God says David was followed his commandments. He did all the things right. But yet when you read the Bible in Acts chapter two, it says that David has not yet ascended into heaven. David's waiting in his grave. And so it is with all of those who are good and wonderful and righteous people. And so that's the testimony of scriptures that when a person dies, they remain in an unconscious state in the grave. And when Christ comes the second time, which is in first Thessalonians chapter four, verses 16 through 18, it's when Christ comes the second time, then the dead in Christ rise, and then they go up to be with the Lord, and so shall they ever be with the Lord. So when someone has that experience, we would say, okay, you definitely had a miraculous experience. We're gonna test it to scripture. If the test proves the experience to not be of God, then we have to say, okay, then where did this experience come from? Could this be a deceptive act from the enemy? And somebody might say, well, what would be so bad about that? Like, why, why would it be bad to believe or teach that, you know, when a person dies, they immediately go to heaven, can come back down and communicate? I'm not sure if we've ever watched and paid attention to a lot of, I'm gonna use an extreme example here, but I'm not sure if we paid attention to a lot of the cult behaviors that happens even just in our country, let alone the world. A lot of times, people have literally taken their own lives because they were instructed by a deceased loved one to take their lives so they can be with them in heaven forever, etc. That's a very bad thing, you know? So unfortunately, a wrong biblical concept of death can get people to do very extreme things. I think about radical Islamic movements where sometimes they say there's a reward that will be waiting for you in heaven if you kill yourself as well as several other civilians and the list goes on. So there's, there's, there's some pretty unfortunate ramifications to a false teaching of what happens when a person dies. So it's important to pay attention to what they say, acknowledge the miracle, but miracles, while they are not to be ignored, they need to be tested by scripture. If they don't pass the test of scripture, then we know that God is not the one that gave that miraculous experience. And we need to acknowledge that the Bible does say the enemy unfortunately can do ex miracles as well. And we need to accept it as that. Wow. 
Great response. And by the way, we're actually going to have an episode in the future where we will spend time wrestling with this issue also. So yeah. follow-up question, though, sure. is we understand this idea of death as a sleep, right? Mm -hmm. Are there psychological benefits for believing what the scripture is teaching on this thing? I mean, is it much more comforting than the person who, you know, goes straight to heaven or whatever? Absolutely. You know, as I stated before, it's like it, it gives you hope. I am sure you have hope hmm. to be reunited with your beloved. I have hope to be reunited with my mom and my dad who is now sleeping as well. And so there's beautiful psychological impacts. There's also protection. You know, there's a psychological peace and comfort in knowing what the truth is of what God says about the state of the dead. And it kind of protects you from some of the falsehoods out there. So that removes a lot of anxiety yeah. that allows for peace, you know, that allows for rest. And so, yeah, there's definitely some beautiful psychological benefits that I've seen on my end. And I can only imagine as a chaplain, the kind of psychological benefits I, you've also seen I was thinking, yourself. I was thinking the other day, um, the first six months after my wife's dad, it was very painful for me. I woke up every day crying, mm -hmm. every day, because I looked to my side and she wasn't there. So I would go into the bathroom and cry because I didn't want my daughter to hear me or whatever. And I remember saying, you know, I would have, I would be very, I would have a lot of faith to believe that she is watching me suffering like this. Yeah. And as much as she said she loved me and not do anything about this. So knowing that she's no more, she's just waiting gives me the peace that I'll, I'll see her again. Right, she's not suffering, not she's suffering. not in pain or anxiety. Not in pain or anxiety. Just resting, uh -huh. sleeping in the grave. Yeah. We got one more question. Why don't we go to our third question? Speaking of sleeping, what is believed about the dead communicating with the living through dreams like the dead communicate with God? Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and it has a very simple answer, and the Bible is very clear. Bible views that attempt to communicate with the dead through dreams or whatever the case, views that as a sin. The best example I can bring, it, I can bring up is the King, King Saul. Mm. When he was, he felt lonely. His, his, his mentor was Prophet Samuel, mm. and Samuel had already died. So he felt lonely and he went and he, 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 he had a conversation with a medium. And out of that conversation with the medium, King Saul lost the blessing of God. God's presence was no more with him because he chose to go talk to a dead person. So it's very clear in the Bible that is viewed as a sinful behavior. I had a thought to that. Um, in Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 2, it talks about dreams come as a result of a lot of what we're thinking about and doing. You know, I remember one time I dreamed about pizza <laughs> and, you know, and, and the reason I dreamed about pizza is because I passed a pizza shop It made a pizza that I really loved, and I was thinking about that pizza all day. And then eventually I went to bed that night and then I had a dream about pizza. And so the reality is that sometimes what your mind dwells on a lot, you can end up having a dream about it. And that's just a normal way that the psyche works. And this is sometimes what people are experiencing. They miss their loved ones. They want to hear from their loved ones. And as a result of that, sometimes a dream can come. But as far as does the Bible teach that that in fact was their deceased loved one, kind of like what we discovered already, you know, the Bible does teach that they're in an unconscious state. So it's not that they themselves are actually speaking to us. They are in an unconscious state, unable to communicate. I really would encourage everyone to consider what was referenced earlier in the program, which is um, Ecclesiastes 9, 5 and 6. It says that the dead know not anything. It says their love, their hatred, their this, their that. It's all perished. It's all ceased at that moment. So that's why we know there cannot be intelligible conversations that are happening with our deceased loved ones. But we could have a dream where we're just thinking about them and then we see them in the dream but it doesn't mean that it's actually them that's talking with us. And you know, and again, it provides safety. It provides a lot of safety. Unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of phenomenons happening today where people are not doing some good things, but it's because of 
what they're communicating with. They're communicating with things. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's really important that that story that you mentioned in 1 Samuel 28 uh, with King Saul, it was actually demons impersonating mm -hmm. God's people. And that's a very important thing to remember is that this is the devil's work. I want to encourage people to always remember, as God is real, so is Satan. God's desire is to save, Satan's desire is to deceive, to kill and to destroy. So we always have to remember that we are in the middle of this battle. So we've got to be very careful about what we accept as truth. But yeah, those are some things to think about. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dwayne, and thank you, Ivan. Appreciate the response, the conversation we had. I think mm -hmm. we just scratched the surface yeah. on yeah. the subject of death, sure. but I think the way that uh, we've discussed it and the way that you've shared has been truly hopeful. So Amen. thank you again. Yeah. Today, we're at the end of our program. It hasn't necessarily been an easy topic, but it's something we've all wondered about at some time or other. But today, I've learned that there is more to life than life itself, and that there is a hope even in death. A big thank you to all of you for joining us. I hope you'll join us again next week for another episode of Hope at Night. God bless.